With the Trump administration in power, Israeli politicians have been celebrating this new opportunity, ramping up settlement projects. Some of these are even financed by Trump's own son-in-law, rumored to be the president's pick to broker so-called peace in the region. Can I reveal, Jared, how long we've known you? <laughs> While these illegal settlements grow into Palestinian villages, some are built directly in the middle of thriving cultural centers, such as Hebron, one of the most hyper-militarized cities in the world. When I was in Hebron, I was shocked by how aggressively the police state imposed an apartheid system. All of the residents I talked to had horror stories of life under brutal occupation. Sometimes Israeli soldiers themselves dissent, even in the face of very severe repercussions. One of whom is Iran Afrati, who was stationed in Hebron during his time in the Israeli army. Since leaving the military after years as a combat soldier, Afrati has dedicated his life to documenting Israeli war crimes and fighting the apartheid system. Iran, you went from being a soldier in the IDF to being a very outspoken critic of both the occupation and continued takeover of Palestine. What made you go through such a profound transformation? Well, uh, it didn't something that happened immediately, obviously. Growing up in Israel, you know, you ask me what was my role in the military. I'm not sure that my role started with my enlisted. I think my role started when I was about five and I realized that my father is put in uniform and going out to Lebanon uh, as a reserve soldier. That's the first time I felt that I'm a part of the military. Uh, the next time was in, uh, you know, kindergarten when soldiers came in to tell us about uh, the independent war uh, just after the Holocaust Day Memorial. Um, the next time will be when I was 16 and uh, I will get my first draft letter and in this draft letter, it will be written that I am a property of the military. This is something that every kid in Israel goes through. When you're getting into the military system in the end, you're already so much embedded inside the military. The military is a part of your identity. It's as much you as you are Israeli or Jewish, for that matter, in Israel. And going into the military, I was expecting to be a manifestation of me just in uniform, uh, protecting my country, protecting my family. I grew up on hearing the stories from Auschwitz of my grandma. So my uh, mother's side, my grandma and grandpa was the only survivors from their family, from the Holocaust. Uh, all of my grandma's family were killed in Auschwitz. The stories from my grandpa that was also the only survivor from his family from the Holocaust. And from the other side, my grandpa and grandma from my father's side, grew up and hearing this, their stories about Jerusalem and what it is to grow up without freedom under the British mandate. For me, being in the military is to protect them and to make sure that our life will go on as in freedom and you know, in good uh, will. Um, I went through seven months of boot camp and in the end of the seven months, I found myself in Hebron, uh, this, the only city that have a settlement in the middle of the city. So getting into the Hebron, uh, one of the first things that I had to do was protect a Jewish holiday. And my job is to put on curfew 180,000 Palestinians. So settlers from throughout the West Bank and Israel, Jewish settlers could come into Hebron and celebrate. So there's th thousands and thousands of uh, Israelis and Jewish settlers from across the West Bank coming to celebrate. And the only way to keep them protected is to make sure that not, no Palestinian is living in his home. So literally one of my first tasks was to roam the streets and make sure Palestinians understand they're going into their home and they cannot leave until a second notice, until the next time we're coming in. And the first time was like a movie. You know, we, we birth in into the city with our guns in our hands and our uniform and vest with grenades and uh, six packs of ammunition. And we just scream in curfew. And you see the chaos, you see the people just running from place to place, closing down their shops, running home, because wherever you are when the curfew starts, this is where you're stuck and you cannot go anywhere else. So you better be at home when we're starting to count the curfew. Now the official orders uh, to anyone who breaks curfew is shoot to kill. I never did that, I never met anyone who shoot to kill uh, in this process of a curfew, but that was the orders and they knew it pretty well. They knew what they need to do. Uh, and this feeling of power uh, at once came as a big confusion to me. I think I, I wasn't clear um, if I'm enjoying the power of controlling all of these people 
or if I don't understand why kids look at me frightened. Why are they running away when I'm walking into the street? Before my service, I work as an educator. I love kids. So I think I was very confused on why a, a kid will find me uh, scary. You know, I, I realize now in, perspe in perspective, it got to do something with the fact that I have my boots on, my uniform, my helmet, uh, my six packs of ammunition, my two hand grenades, my M16 <laughs> in my hand, but I didn't realize it right. at the time. And I, and I really couldn't understand that. Um, and I think in a very rapid pace, I realized that my job is actually to maintain an apartheid system. Very, uh, very early on, I understood that the rights that the Jewish settlers have are not the rights that the Palestinians have. I understood that I cannot touch a Jewish settler if he is attacking a Palestinian. The best I can do is call a local police department to come handle it like I would do at home in Jerusalem. So these Jewish settlers that live in Hebron are living under the same rights that I live in, in Jerusalem, but the Palestinian next to them, next house over, next building over, sometimes next apartment over, lives under my rule, my military rule. And I can do whatever I want with him. I can take his home as a temporary base for a few hours to a few days to a few weeks. I can decide that I'm arresting the people of the house and tying them up to defense of my base. Um, if we will get an order to demolish their home or just lock their front door and don't let them out into the street, their house is on, a street that only Jewish settlers can walk on and Palestinian cannot. So they have to walk through windows to yards into the other side, into the Kasbah of Hebron. I think realizing all of that in a very, very early stage in my service, helped me understood that someone was lying to me along the way. I didn't feel like I'm protecting anyone. I didn't feel like I'm helping anyone feeling more safe. I feel like I'm terrorizing people. I feel like for the first time in my life, the boundaries between good and bad that I learned as a kid, and obviously I learned that I'm on the good side, uh, was broken. I felt like I am the terrorist. And my job was literally to scare people so they cannot think about acting against the Israeli settlers or the Israeli military. That was actually our defined mission, to make sure that to instill fear in the hearts of Palestinians in Hebron. And that's exactly what we did. I think Hebron is a really um, intense example of, of apartheid, obviously. Like you just said, the settlements in the middle of the city, it's extremely visible. You have the caged streets, the ghost town, it's, it's horrifying. Why did you speak up and why did you do what you did knowing that you would suffer such repercussions and potentially be banned from returning back to your country? Um, well, growing up in Israel, like I said, I believed that I was the good guy. I mean, the story that all of us are being told all around the world is that the, the very clear difference between good and bad people are there. You learn about the Holocaust growing up. I saw my grandma screaming in the middle of the nights, memories from Auschwitz in our mind, memories to our family. Um, I knew that I am going to be a good human being. You know, in the age of uh, 15, 16, I began being almost obsessed with trying to understand the Nazi side in the Holocaust. Uh, not only to hear the stories of the victims, of the Jewish victims and any other victims from the Holocaust, but to try to understand how can a, a Nazi soldiers get up in the morning, give his kids a kiss, his wife a hug, and go out to the camps and do his job. I just couldn't understand it. And when I got into the occupied territories, uh, for the first time I understood how can there be a contradicting in inside yourself. As a human being, you could do your job and be a one person at home, be a loving, caring uh, you know, boyfriend or a son or brother, uh, and in the same time, hold people under a regime so oppressed that people are dying not from only your bullets, but the amount of calories uh, being entered into their territory, like in Gaza, from depression or sickness, uh, this realization during my time as a soldier uh, of me on the right side of history gave me this urge that something have to be done, something have to be spoken. 
understanding that nothing is really changing from inside, that you have to step outside and start talking with the world about what's going on. Uh, and that's the only way you can live in a place, not only for Palestinians, but for me as well. You know, I don't want to live in an ethnocracy. I don't want to live in an only Jewish state that values uh, a privileged Jewish life on every other life. This urges me to understand that I want my kids to grow up in a place when they don't have to oppress anyone, they don't have to be soldiers. Uh, I guess that's what pushed me to do what I'm doing. Your humanity. <laughs> Let's talk about your time um, after getting out of the military and then you went through a series uh, through the West Bank, interviewing soldiers, getting their testimony. Talk about some of your experiences there that cemented your belief system now and um, opened your mind a little bit more. I think after I left the military, I was still under the impression that the things that I was going through were my personal uh, experience. I understood that I do not believe in the things that I was doing. I understood that I was lied to, but I still didn't have the conviction that what we're doing is on a large scale. And leaving the military and starting interviewing soldiers uh, really, I think, made me understand that there's a systematic oppression uh, that is taking place in the occupied territories. Iran, let's talk about Elor Azaria, the soldier who just got convicted of manslaughter. He executed an unarmed Palestinian man laying in the street, of course, in Hebron on camera. Uh, Israel, of course, is touting this as accountability, right? Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your reaction to the verdict and, yeah, just your, the case in general? I think the uh, Elior Azaria case had to be understood by a few contexts. Mm -hmm. The first one is the context of uh, Israeli military practice of ex executions and targeted killing and also confirming a kill, what Elior Azaria did on the Palestinian in Hebron, uh, are all practices that are alive in the military system, in the even police system or Mossad. It's illegal to continue doing execution. It's the middle of the previous decade in the 2000s. But then something very interesting started. Um, I am in my previous role as a researcher into the Israel military. I was taking testimonies from many soldiers. Uh, and one of the soldiers I'm reaching to is a soldier from a semi-elite unit called in Hebrew Duvdevan, a cherry in English. And he's telling me a story about how uh, He's serving after this role from the after this new rule from the Supreme Court has been mandate, and they cannot do targeting killing anymore. And how their officer is gathering the unit together and telling them, "We're going to go out tonight to capture this person. is highly dangerous. What we're going to do is we're going to come in five or six people's unit into their home in the middle of the night, break in quietly, go up to his bedroom, go into his bed." and put a gun into his head. Now, if he just wake up and surrender, we're taking him into the base. But if he scream, you shoot him in the head. If he lift his blanket, you shoot him in the head. If he lifts his hands or legs or trying to uh, do any movement, you shoot him in the head. Now, because we understand as rational human beings that no human being can wake up in the middle of the night with a gun into his head and not scream or move. We understand these orders as an execution orders that bypass the Supreme Court order. Uh, and instead of saying we're going to execute this person, they're saying we're going to arrest this person, but if we feel there's some kind of danger, maybe you have a gun in his bed, maybe he will scream for help, we execute him. So execution is something that is very much alive. I continue to interview dozens of this cherry unit that tells the same story about different cases, but the same exact practice in the occupied territories. They knew that this is what they're supposed to do. They knew that they were going into homes in the middle of the night to execute people. In October 2015, the latest intifada is starting, and even the official rules of not executing human beings are going off the window from the prime minister, into ministers, into media people. Everybody is talking about it from left to right, about you shoot to kill. If you see a girl with scissors next to you, you shoot to kill. Executions are very much alive in the Israeli uh, uh, military, the Israeli police, the Israeli discourse. People are calling for executions. People are calling for not only executions on, you know, what they call terrorist or resistant, uh, uh, people, Palestinians that are running at you, but they're calling for revenge. 
Um, and when the Lior is doing what he does, he's doing it after he heard it, this specific order of executions every, what they call a terrorist, from every section of the Israeli society. We wouldn't be talking about Elder Azaria if the execution wasn't on a film, let's be honest. I mean, like you said, this is, this is commonplace, this is systematic, it's institutionalized. However, I, I, I do want to talk about how even before he was charged with manslaughter, it was a slap on the wrist at the beginning. I don't know if there was just international pressure that, that mounted at a certain point where they felt like they had to take the investigation forward. But even then, it was a very stark contrast between how right-wing Israelis reacted mm -hmm. to just a house arrest verdict um, than, let's say, people hear when a police officer shoots and executes an unarmed black man. And, and usually you have protests in the street against the police trying to get accountability there. In Israel, it seemed like there was mass rallies in support of El Rosaria. You know, of course, it's not surprising. Israel is selling this idea of the soldiers are more important than anything. The soldiers are more important than the life of Palestinians. Not only the life of soldiers, the soldiers' identity, uh, you know, security, feelings are more important than a Palestinian life. Easiness, uh, the comfortable of people going out to the street and defending every case of manslaughtering that was captured on tape, that is clear that his life is not in danger, you know, they contradict everything that we are being told. And yet, Israelis are saying in a very clear voice not only that we don't believe in that. Not only that we will oppress Palestinian and will act as much as, you know, do whatever we want, but in a very specific way saying, don't uh, confuse us with idea of moral or right or wrong. Whatever soldiers do in the occupied territories are right. Whatever we're doing is the correct thing. I wanted you to talk specifically about the culture within the Israeli military that fosters anti-Arab sentiment and racism, essentially. Yes, I, I think the system, you know, uh, is not only inside the military. It's, it's like, like I said before, that's actually what being an Israeli means. Being an Israeli growing up in the Israeli educational departments, you understand that all the Arabs hate you that they are actually, in a way, the continuation of uh, the biblical Amalek or, uh, or Hitler, or, you know, that everybody there want to throw you into the sea. This is what you're growing up with, and you really believe in that. I mean, going into the military, you're already going so full of hate and fear at the same time that you don't need much to be uh, very aggressive, violent, and, and racist toward Palestinians. They see the Palestinian women and the Palestinian men as subhuman. Uh, the occupied territories are like an ex-territory, when those human beings are not considered to be human beings. This is a, a process that you start in a very early age, being enforced inside your boot camp, and later on when you're going into your service, when you do not see human beings in front of you. Do not believe their uh, sorrow, do not believe their smiles, do not believe their feelings. They are subhuman. But they look just like you. I mean, there's so many Arab Jews. It's incredible. Yeah. Like yourself. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that the, the Arab Jews in Israel are probably the most tragic story in the entire story of Zionism after the Palestinians. Uh, you know, and it's not being talked enough, obviously, inside the Israeli society or in the world. The Mizrahi Jew, the Arab Jews that came around the years of 50 and onward into Israel, uh, some came by choice, came by, some came by force, but they didn't came to a country that was theirs. Came only about two years after Israel was already gave out much, most of the land into the European people. And they understood that they cannot hold the territory alone. They need more people on the ground to fight off Palestinians or Palestinian refugees if they will come back. And then they went off and brought most of the Arab Jews and put them in the most terrible places in Israel, on the borders, on the borders with Egypt or Jordan or uh, Lebanon and Syria. We put them at buffer zones to protect us from Palestinians. Some of them came in the civils. Uh, the Zionist organization sends delegations into these Arab countries 
uh, and called the Jews there to come into Israel, the Jewish homeland. Many of them didn't want to. Many of them, like in Iraq or Egypt, had a good life or in Morocco and wanted to stay. They didn't know what will be the destiny of this new country that I understood that there's very much likely that a lot of wars will go on there. They felt protected in those countries and they said no. And the Zionist organization sent another delegations into some of these countries of people this kind as Arabs from those countries to terrorize those people, to try to force them to come into Israel. They were born synagogues. We have testimonies today that talks about how they ran after people in the street and beat them down as so-called Arabs from Morocco, from uh, Egypt or Iraq trying to scare them. And immediately after that, more people from the Zionist movement would come and say, you see, the only safe place you have is Israel. You have to come now. And after they came, they were being sent into the most uh, uh, disgusting forms of uh, settlement for the newcomers from those Arab countries, being sprayed from DDT uh, with, uh, with uh, gas, trying to clean them up before they joining into the uh, Ashkenazi, the European kids, to play with them. They were separated and segregated for years that was not their country and it's still not their country. And what they had to do to start to assimilate themselves inside this new country was to make sure that everybody understood that they're actually not Arabs. They look like Arabs, they talk Arabic, but they're not Arabs, they're Jewish. Because you can be an American Jew and you can be a European Jew, but you cannot be an Arab Jew in Israel. And they erase their identity and they starting to form what we know today as the most extreme right in Israel. They are the extreme right because they have to solidify themselves as the most loyal citizens of the states. You hear this as a cycle of violence though. And every time I bring up, you know, especially being on the ground in the West Bank, visiting the Dewabsha family mm -hmm. or who's left of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whenever you bring up these, these horrifying stories and accounts of terror on behalf of the Israeli settlers, a lot of people just say, what about the stabbing attacks? What about, you know, what about the terrorist attacks on behalf of Palestinians? And it's painted as a, as a equal fight, as a cycle of violence. And then you have um, the, the truck attack that just happened in Jerusalem. As a former soldier, how do you view these attacks? How do you view the stabbings, especially when they are directed at soldiers? Well, as an ex-soldier, uh, I learned very personally that if you will not respect existence, you can expect resistance. And this is how people resist. Uh, Israel as a state like to use the, the idea that Palestinians only understand force or power. But the truth of the matter is that Israelis only understand power and force. Every other attempt from Palestinians to try to negotiate this situation in a diplomatic way was uh, countered by more attacks, more oppression, uh, and more occupation, more stealing of the land, more destroying of homes, more settlements being built. We decided to call uh, we're going into the UN a diplomatic terrorism and to go into the ICC, uh, you know, international terrorism. We basically describe every form of resistance as terrorism. Because the sole idea of the occupation is not to be safe. The sole idea is to create an ethnically cleansed uh, piece of land only for Jewish people, with Palestinian workers. Uh, of course, some Palestinians can stay and do stuff for us, but this is our land. What people maybe don't understand is that Israel is creating the conditions in to uh, the situation of constantly having to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. We're creating this situation by oppressive, oppressing millions of people until do a, a, a phase where they have no other choice by resist. So many of these people lost a family member, uh, had been to prison or lost someone in prison and understood that nothing could be changed because the truth is that Israel do not hear the diplomacy. Israel do not hear the calls of Palestinian for equality. What we are seeing in Palestine is what a lot of people like to describe as the most uh, complicated political situation of our time is probably the most simple uh, situation, political situation of our time. It's a situation about equality. 
It's amazing that you say that, Iran, because this is painted as the most complex, the most hard to solve. Uh, it, they've been fighting over there for thousands of years. You know, you hear these mm -hmm. these things, but really, it really does come down to basic equality and humanity. Mm -hmm. um, do, would you say that you support the right of Palestinians to fight their occupiers? Absolutely. I support the right of every human being uh, under an oppressive military rule to resist this military rule by any mean uh, possible. Uh, I do not believe that Israel have a right to occupy millions of human beings without every decent uh, human, simple, basic human rights uh, for their name. And I do not believe that Israel would change uh, on its own. At no point in history there was uh, a state or a power that had the power to control over other human beings and benefit from it and just decided to let go of this power by its own. It was always forced on them by the resistance of the people underneath them or the intervention of other forces around the world. And unfortunately, uh, I, as I do support the Palestinian right to resist in any way, I do not believe that their resistance is enough. I do believe that the rest of the world have to interfere in what's going on in Palestine. There's nothing else that we can do except for giving all the Palestinian equal rights and starting a new state, a new uh, equality system for all human beings on the ground.